Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. We've got a great program uh, set up for you today. We're going to kick things off and we're going to, with Mark Peterson, who you all know is the uh, leader of the AICP Advocacy Group, and Melanie Loritzen, who leads the tax advocacy area. So welcome, Mark and Melanie. Great to be here, Eric. Okay. Well, what we have on the agenda is we're first going to just give you an update on the status of the tax bill and talk about a few of those implications. And then Melanie is going to lead a session with Aaron Collins, the National Taxpayer Advocate, um, that's going to be a great dialogue. After that, Mark's going to come back on uh, with me, and we're going to have the DC and profession update, which Melanie will, will, will stay on for us with. And then we're going to close out uh, with a very strategic discussion with the, a former AICPA chair, Kimberly Ellison Taylor, and she's going to give you some insights on strategy and growth planning, and then we're going to wrap things up uh, with our open forum. But before we, we get underway, Mark and Melanie, we just want to acknowledge we, we, we've hit a milestone here yep. on the town hall. The reason why we've hit a milestone is because there's so much information for us to discuss every couple of weeks, give our best interpretation, you know, give some advice and guidance to the town hall community, and also learn from the town hall community because their questions and input is extremely valuable. So we have now reached a million live and on de on demand participations and we actually have an active community over of over 30,000 professionals that attend regularly on most of these live town halls we're now having close to 10,000 participants uh, so thanks mark you've been on this journey melanie you've been on it um and lisa simpson's not with us today but uh she's she's been an anchor of the town hall as well so, Mark, well, moving on to uh, a topic that we really unpacked a couple, we a couple of weeks ago, the right. passing of the tax bill uh, by the House. Lots going on in Washington, D.C. right now. So let's, you know, here's some news from today's House Ways and Means Committee. So maybe start here and then we'll get into how you're seeing the, the, the current status of the tax bill. Sure, sure. Thanks, Eric, for, for setting that up. And it all kind of comes together. So first, let's talk about the hearing today. So this is a during the tax season hearing for, for the commissioner of the IRS, uh, Danny Werfel. Oftentimes we do one post tax season, but this one was actually during it. And the if you think about the bill, the Tax Relief for Families and Workers Act, that is the Wyden-Smith bill that has passed the House of Representatives, the Smith is Chairman Smith of Ways and Means. And one of the reasons why he had Commissioner Warfel up was to talk about implementing the IRS's ability to implement that bill when it's signed into law. Obviously, uh, Chairman Smith's an optimist because um, he's the, the godfather of the bill. And so a couple things that, that came up during the hearing, which again, uh, was just earlier that today, uh, a real focus on um, the IRS's ability, assuming it's gonna pass and become law, to um, implement quickly and take care of the uh, CTC filers, child tax credit filers. Uh, that was one thing that raised. Another thing that was raised was concern and confusion around the ERC. Um, you know, obviously we've all heard about a lot of the fraud that's been focused on the e ERC filings, uh, but there is also the ability to sort through that and make sure that legitimate small businesses uh, also have the ability to avail themselves of it. And so that was a focus of the hearing. Um, you know, the discussion around uh, the delay, the IRS delay of the 1099K uh, and concerns around that, you know, this is the uh, the reporting requirement for, you know, eBay and, and Ticketmaster. Uh, some questions around there. And then, of course, wrapping it up was obviously about IRS service uh, and their ab ability to, to um, meet taxpayer needs uh, under these challenging times with a lot going on and a tax bill that's being considered during tax season, Eric. Well, Mark, thanks. So let's, we, we covered this slide a couple of weeks ago, but just to maybe a quick refresher of what's in the tax bill. And I mean, everyone over the past week, you know, was paying attention to what the Senate was doing. 
so also, so just give us your thoughts on you know the likelihood of this actually getting you know passed by the Senate. So it's we we read wind sock here, Rick. So yeah. we read which way the wind is blowing. And if you look out at where the bill came from, the, the bill had a strong vote coming out of Ways and Means. These are very popular bipartisan provisions, uh, both on the CTC side and on the business uh, tax issues as well. Um, and so strong vote coming out of Ways and Means, extremely strong vote in the House of Representatives, 357 to 70. That's mm -hmm. what sent it over to the Senate. Now, I think the thing that we're watching really closely, by the way, the Senate is currently in their state work period or recess until uh, February 26th. That's going to come into play on a couple other issues we're going to talk about later. Um, but they, they have to decide how they're going to handle it in the Senate. The leaders would like to um, put it on the House floor, uh, the, or excuse me, the Senate floor. The Democrat leaders would like to move forward with this unamended and unchanged because they know it got a strong vote in the in the House. That's a good sign. There is pushback on that. Um, the ranking Republican on the Senate Finance Committee, Crapo, Senator Crapo from Idaho has said he's in no hurry. He'd like to see it go through um, some due diligence, go through a committee markup, committee uh, uh, process in order to potentially amend the bill. If it is amended, the likelihood of it happening goes down. Mm -hmm. So what we're watching really closely is, is there ability to get to some arrangement or agreement where it could go to the floor versus go into the committee? And it's possible. Uh, or does it go into the committee? And if changes are made, I think the changes are less, less likely that it comes out of the committee. Um, again, it, there's, there's peril uh, about the outcome of the bill, but there's still strong bipartisan uh, support for elements of it. There are other things, though, that they have to figure out because we were going to talk about government funding coming up here shortly, Eric. And uh, those are the kinds of things that swirl around as well. Well, Mark, so that's so right now we're talking like sometime in March, like the earliest it could it could happen uh, mid-March or, you know, even if it would even if it went straight to the floor, it would take a while. It would take, you know, a couple of weeks in order for them to get it on and off the center floor if everybody was in agreement. So there, this has this has some time to play out. Absolutely. So Melanie, so the other question so now we're talking likelihood uncertain if it in the timing mid March. So this clearly is what you'd call a retroactive bill. <laughs> so <laughs> lots of questions coming in, you know, concerns, you know, small firms uh, have stated they've, you know, they've, they've completed their small business returns. Do we, you know, what, what should they do? I know you're talking to all, a lot of practitioners. We've, we've got the comment that Mark shared from the IRS commissioner. What, what, what's our practical advice for the town hall attendees? So Eric, that's definitely a really good question. And definitely members are asking that question. I think before I start answering it, it has to be in the context of what Mark just gave, right? Mm -hmm. This bill is moving very slowly. Um, there's no guarantee it will pass. And if it That's does, cool. you know, the most optimistic scenario we're looking at March. And then you also have to add on top of it that the IRS does take some time to be able to implement it once it mm -hmm. gets published. So really when it's all said and done and the Commissioner Warfall said it, he said it two weeks ago, he said about two weeks ago, he again said it today. Yeah, he did. Don't wait, file your returns go ahead and move forward with it. And that's pretty much a blanket statement. Um, is there the fear of having to amend? Yes, there is. Um, but given the circumstances, it really is the most uh, practical approach to this that we have. Well, thanks. We're even hearing some, you know, some firms, you know, the filing ties up their billing. So if you've completed return, file it now. And, this, and then there's other questions coming in related to SALT. Same, same advice same for the advice. individual returns? Yeah, go ahead, move forward with it. And if you need to amend, it will have to be after April 15th. Okay, well, Mark, I don't, we've got, we want to move to this next segment. Is there yeah, anything absolutely. else you, you want to share here? Okay, so you and I can get out of the way and let Melanie introduce uh, our, our next guest, which we're thrilled to have, uh, Aaron. Wonderful. Holmes. Absolutely. So as Aaron gets pulled up, um, 
Let me start by saying Aaron really doesn't need further introduction. People know who you are, they listen to you, and they just love you. So let's go ahead and dive in. In January, you submitted a report to Congress and that you make various administrative and legislative recommendations. And I'm hoping that we can touch base on the top issues that taxpayers have had for 2023. So do you wanna go ahead and kick it off and maybe start with IRS transparency? Sure. Well, actually, let me just kind of step back up. First of all, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for having me uh, today at your town hall. Um, real quick, and I think most people are familiar with it. By statute, our office is required to identify and discuss the 10 most serious problems impacting taxpayers. And for the past four years, both tax practitioners, IRS, IRS employees, it has been incredibly challenging. Um, not sure I need to tell anybody who's been in the tax industry how difficult the last four years have been. We've had processing delays, refund delays, uh, problems with uh, backlog of unprocessed returns, uh, difficulty reaching a customer service representative. I mean, the, line, the list can go on and on and on. The good news is um, by the end of 2023, we were in a little bit of a different situation. The IRS had caught up on all of the original filing. So if you didn't have a problem with the return, whether it be paper or electronic, it was being processed. So that is really good news. Um, one of the things that the secretary um, was very much focused on was customer service with the telephone. Um, and you know, good news is people were able to get through. I know a lot of practitioners probably weren't as happy because the tax practitioner line wasn't as fast as the general 1040 line. Um, and there were some concerns about that. But my, my problem I had with um, moving the resources over to answer the phone, which again, was very good for taxpayers and even practitioners, but the downside was it came at a cost. And so what we saw last year was because they were increasing answering the phones, uh, the folks that did the phones were also the ones that processed the paper. So we started to see a fair amount of um, backlog, I hate that word, but uh, on the amended returns. Uh, ERC, which I suspect you're gonna ask me about, um, <laughs> yes. you know, that was one of the big, um, you know, about the biggest volume of the amended returns on the business side uh, were the ERC returns. And then also just the correspondence. Uh, that was higher than any previous year and was longer. It was more overage than the previous three, four years. So that was an area that came at a cost. Um, Aaron, identity theft. Yeah, those go ahead. Are all, every single one of those are of high priority for our membership. So thank you for touching base on those. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, anyone that does return preparation, I mean, these are just key things. Yes. Uh, the other thing we focused on this year was, again, what I call kind of moving, robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, is they took their customer service representatives um, that were working or agents that were working other parts, including identity theft, moved them over to the telephones because that was a priority. And again, it was a good priority. IRS did much better than they did in previous years. But what happened was that now created a problem on identity theft. And those victims that were dealing with identity theft, it was taking about 20 months for them to authenticate themselves, work with the IRS and release those refunds. And I don't think anyone disagrees that that 20 months is an unreasonable period of time. Good news is I think the commissioner um, is very focused on this now and you know it is being discussed as to, do we move all those folks back so we can focus on that? So we are working with the IRS in that particular area. And you started by asking about transparency and I as usual, took a you know <laughs> trip down another direction, as I always do. Um, yeah, transparency is an issue, I think, uh, for a couple things. One, you know, again, as the IRS has struggled, just own it. Come forward, let taxpayers know, let practitioners know what are the challenges, what are the problems, so that we can manage expectations. We may not like what we're hearing, but at least we can understand what they are and we can work with taxpayers, in your case, clients, so that they can have their expectations managed. You know, for 20 years, I sat in a similar chair uh, working with clients, and no matter what was happening, it was always my fault. Um, so I do understand that uh, the practitioners get the brunt, and if IRS are having problems, it's all your fault. You're the one who caused it. You don't, you don't know who to call. You don't know how to fix it. And it makes it very difficult for practitioners when IRS has so many problems uh, because it's, 
again, it comes back to them that they must not be doing things correctly. So usually that is not the case, but uh, unfortunately with clients, you might take the brunt of it. Um, so those are just some of the key areas that we were looking at. Um, one of the other things I know we've talked about before, I kind of refer to as the baby I didn't give birth to, which is online accounts. Yes. Um, very much want to push online accounts and it is moving, maybe not as fast as I'd like, but specifically on the tax pro side of it. You know, I think the vision, the IRS does not disagree, is that you can go into your tax pro account and if you have 100 taxpayers, you can click. So all the, you know, I represent Melanie. I can go into your name, click it, and I should be able to see everything that you have in your individual online account. To me, that's a game changer for practitioners because they may not need to pick up the phone. Just give me the data I need on my clients so I can help them. And then that would free up the phone for those who truly need it. That is our dream where we could just log in and have access to all our clients' data. Um, but we do see that it is moving. It's probably moving slower than what we'd like to see it, but it is moving slowly but surely in the right direction. So we definitely appreciate that. And while you're talking on the online accounts, I definitely want to say um, you have a wonderful blog where you discuss all the latest information, you provide tips, you share your thoughts. Um, and February 1st, you put out a blog on the online services accounts. Um, and just for everybody in the audience, the original slide, there is a link to both the annual report to Congress and also the blog. So we definitely appreciate any insights that you share on online accounts. Well, thank you for the plug and the commercial. So. <laughs> You're welcome. Did you want to touch base a little bit on legislative updates, which you are also sure. included in the book? Right. So, um, again, by statute, uh, Congress gives us, and it's a unique um, opportunity because the IRS is an administrative function. It doesn't have the same ability to lobby, so to speak, or make legislative recommendations. That's a policy that should be coming from Treasury, not from IRS. So the fact that within the IRS, we have that opportunity to go uh, to Congress and make administrative recommendations in a legislative format um, is, is very unique. So, you know, a lot of the fixes we have, and I believe there's, I'm trying to remember if it's 65 or 66, I've lost track, um, recommendations, um, you know, some of them are just very simple um, and things that we've heard from practitioners over the years. So, for example, uh, the quarterly estimated tax payments. Um, God, wouldn't it be nice if they were quarterly and in the same order? Um, you know, again, that's a simple fix. Um, you know, the other thing that's also another simple fix is what I call the mailbox rule. You know, treating electronically submitted tax payments and documents the same as by putting it in the mail. Uh, again, these are just simple little fixes. The bigger fixes, um, and unfortunately, we've had a number of disaster reliefs over the last few years, including the COVID disaster relief. And as a result, that one impacted basically all taxpayers across the United States. And what a lot of people didn't focus on is when you file a refund claim, there's in essence two criteria. One is that it's timely. And two, that you have the ability to reach back and, and get access to the refund, or I call it the look back rule. Um, and when the IRS provided the relief, especially the first COVID relief, they gave people till July 15th. Um, if you filed during that period of time, since it was not an extension, rather it was a postponement, you know, the legal difference meant uh, in essence that you didn't have access to the look back period. So you could file in June or July, three years later, and it would be timely. But if you had withholding or estimated tax, you would be denied because it was out of time. So one of the things that IRS finally did with, with the help of Treasury is shortly before that three year period was up, they did extend that or postpone so it was consistent with it. So it would be July 15th or when you file the return down the road. Um, but that's something that they need to fix for all purposes. So every time there's a disaster relief, we would just have both the front end of filing, but also the refund period be consistent with the extended time. So that's something I'd love to see Congress do. And then for the Californians on the call, um, last year was a real problem because if you recall with the disaster relief, they provided taxpayers until October 15th to not only file, but also pay. And this may surprise a few people, but you normally don't prepare all your returns for all of your clients within two weeks of the filing date. I know that's shocking. 
Um, so I, we saw a lot of accountants doing what they do best, and they were spreading out the work uh, over a number of months to get those returns prepared. The earlier returns that still owed money, a lot of taxpayers filed it anyway, um, but they decided to hold payment until October 15th. And the challenge that came about was um, the IRS systems, they received a, ref a return, there was no matching payment, they started sending out notice and demand letters saying because you did not pay, you were subject to penalties and interest if you didn't pay in the next 15 days. That caused an all sorts of problems and confusions because again, taxpayers went back to the accountant and said, see, you're wrong because IRS says I owe the money. That was a big problem. So again, I would like Congress to come in and help us you know, clarify the rules. You don't have to send the notice and demand until it in fact is due. So these are just simple little things that we're asking Congress to fix. And we align, there's quite a few proposals that you have and recommendations that we've also put out there. So hopefully we'll see some traction in that. Quick question. I'm not sure if you saw the Wall Street Journal article that came out about e-filing where somebody was suggesting paper filing. Uh, we definitely support modernization of the IRS. It's been a long-term advocacy support that we've had and we do encourage e-filing. Any of thoughts you have on it? Yeah, I, you know, again, it's a, guess it depends what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to get your client's refund quicker, you absolutely want to file electronic and you want to include the direct deposit information so that you can get it through the system. Um, the IRS always says you'll get payment within 21 days. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everyone knows that is a, it's sort of their goal, but they, they exceed that goal on a regular basis. Um, I've seen some of the folks this year ready two to five days are getting the payments going out the door. Um, so if you file electronic, it is going to be much quicker. If you file on paper, and you know, I've been in the campuses a few times, and it really is, and I say this respectfully, a human supply chain. We have IRS employees from the time you open the mail to processing the mail to sorting the mail to removing staples. I didn't realize staples and paper clips were such a problem. <laughs> But um, changing the order of that the return comes in so it can be processed. And it is it, it very time consuming versus electronic files. So if you're interested in getting it moved quickly, you really want to do the electronic filing. Thanks. I'm going to shift gears here for a second. Supposedly, this filing season was originally set to be uneventful. There was no year on tax package and things looked to be that they were going to be business as usual. But now we're facing a potential shutdown in the heart of the filing season. Um, and there is no filing season contingency plan. Can you share your thoughts around a filing season contingency plan or just in general with a shutdown? Yeah, but you made me smile because you said <laughs> filing season. So in IRS speak, filing season is January to April 15th. Um, when I was on the outside, sitting in a chair similar to most of the folks on this call, filing season was still October 15th or even beyond, depending on the type of clients you were filing. So I always think it's interesting people focus on October or blah, 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 uh, April 15th. Yeah. So the challenge is, you know, I don't think this shocks anyone. If, if you have a government shutdown, that will mean, and I think the, the plan that the IRS had was that about 30 some odd percent of their employees would be designated as the term is exempted or exempt. Um, so they would be required, you know, to come in. Um, unfortunately for TAS, uh, we will be down to a skeleton crew. So it'll be myself and a handful of other folks. Our case advocates are not authorized or not determined to be exempt. So they would not be working during a shutdown. So it is a, it's a real challenge um, as to what can happen uh, during the filing season. Uh, with respect to the pending work. And it's not a good time to have a government shutdown. It never is, though. So <laughs> well, it never is, period, uh, to have that disruption. Uh, but the filing season, if you're going to pick a date, that's probably one of the worst times. Right. So, Aaron, you brought up ERC. Let me ask you some tough questions in ERC. Uh, there was an OPR article that came out in which it said that they can't guarantee that tax professionals won't be sanctioned for preparing amended income tax returns for clients that submitted ERC claims through a third party. Now, there has been some concern in our membership that the IRS is kind of meaning to sweep up the above board tax professionals into the mix of the ERC fraud. Do you have any advice for members or can you reflect on what you believe the IRS's intention is? Yeah, I certainly hope that their intention was 
similar to any other issue, it really is our, our practitioners following the due diligence. You know, the, the rules are set forth under Circular 230 um, as to what you're supposed to do. Um, I, I'm hoping they weren't intending it to be any sort of a threat, but rather just reinforcing and educating people as to what you need to do. So again, I think if you are well-meaning and you do your due diligence, uh, you ask appropriate questions, if it doesn't appear to be accurate, then you can't have willful blindness. I mean, you need to do ask some follow-up questions. Um, so I, I don't think it's any different than filing any other re type of return. It's have you done your due diligence? Um, the information that you have, is it accurate? Is it complete? Um, you know, do you have any reason to believe it's not? And if so, I think you need to ask those follow-up questions. So, you know, as we all know, in the last year or so, there's been a lot of attention on ERC with respect to aggressive, potentially even fraudulent claims. And that is a real concern for multiple reasons. One, I don't think it's good for taxpayers. I don't think it's good for the industry. Um, it's not good if IRS is paying um, improper payments out to you know taxpayers or businesses. So I do understand, but I think also the IRS is in a, I don't know, between a rock and a hard place. The last thing they wanna do is be paying improper uh, payments to those who don't qualify. On the other hand, the challenge is those who do qualify are in essence being penalized because now the IRS is really having to take um, a lot more due diligence on their front end prior to payment. So it is slowing down the process. I think everyone's familiar that the um, IRS came out with a moratorium, uh, I believe it was September 14th. Um, if you have a claim that was filed prior to September 14th, IRS is working them. And, but I'm gonna be manage expectations because I believe in being transparent. Um, they are being very slow. Um, IRS is paying some, but not close to the rate they were paying them in the back, in the past. So it is taking a lot longer to process them. Um, if you were filed after the moratorium, so September 14th or 15th afterwards, those cases are going to sort of the back of the pile. So I suspect um, it's going to take at least through the end of filing season or longer before the IRS does the pre-moratorium ones. So if you're post moratorium, it is going to be a longer delay. So again, managing expectations. And you can't really fault the IRS for trying to prevent fraud, but at the same time, we would all like the legitimate claims to be paid a lot quicker. Aaron, I could spend hours talking to you about ERC, <laughs> but I can't. And we do need to get starting to wrap up. So let me ask one last question. Um, any advice you have for taxpayers and tax professional professionals as they are going through this filing season? Yeah, I think it just gets back to the basics that I think, you know, all of your members are very familiar with. You know, I sound like a broken record. Check for errors. If you care about getting it timely, file electronic. If it's a refund, include your bank information to speed up the payment. Double check for um, errors. And, and some of the really simple things that we see come into our shop, which is just verify the wages and the 1099s. If the amounts are off, that's gonna trigger the IRS to either send out a notice or it's gonna cause a problem. You know, this year, I think the good news is December 31st, I believe fell on a Sunday, it's on a weekend. Um, so as a result, you're not gonna have that mismatch on your pay stubs. What we saw a lot of taxpayers doing was take their last pay stub which could have a couple days in the next year or a few days less in the previous year. So they were off a very small percentage, but that caused the return to get pulled out. Um, so the last thing you want is to have you know, those delays. So if you need to wait a week or two to get a W-2 or 1099 from the client, it probably makes more sense to try and get the right numbers. And then also, depending on what you're looking for, you might be able to leverage your online account for the taxpayer to find information if it's missing. So again, just get back to basics, do the due diligence and you know, make your clients jump through some hoops and get you your documentation that you need. Well, thank you, Erin. Unfortunately, our time is up. We hope to have you back again and we definitely appreciate everything, your insights and your thoughts. All right, well, thank you so much and thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And this, uh, Melanie, we've just here, this is what we covered and got a couple of links of, uh, of information, one regarding Aaron Collins' blog and another one regarding the annual report to Congress. That was a great session, Melanie. Thanks yeah. for moderating it.
So continuing on, we've got a lot of questions coming in. And, and Melanie, I think when we get to the technical update section, I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple of them with you. Um, one is we didn't, we didn't, you know, talk about, you know, filing extensions uh, versus, you know, filing now. So there's a number, number of comments related to that uh, in the Q&A. Mark, uh, the other <laughs> topic that we just heard Aaron and right. Melanie talk a little bit about, um, and actually, you know, there's been so much talk about the border deal. Um, I think some people have forgotten that, you know, the, the funding bills need to, pass as soon as almost, you know, the Senate gets back in back in session or the House comes back uh, for, for in session after their their break. No, absolutely. And it, it has an impact on things like, you know, the potential for that tax bill getting out of the Senate. But so just to remind everybody, um, they had a short term funding deal in order to get to basically a chunk of the government uh, is funded until March 1st. This another chunk is funded until March 8th. That second chunk on March 8th includes Treasury and the IRS. So that's when there could be a potential disruption um, to the IRS, which we just discussed. So there's a couple ways to get through this. One is regular order. They do all the bills. Uh, each of the bills gets signed into law by the president, and then the government's funded. That's called regular order. There's no way they can get done that, that done in the time they have left. So they're they get back, Senate gets back on the 26th, House gets back on the 28th. Regular order isn't going to happen. The other idea is, or, or possible pathway, is what's called an omnibus, which is they just take all of it and they, mm -hmm. they put it in one big omnibus package and they pass it. There's history. That's actually happened many years uh, where they can't get through the regular order process, so they bundle it all together. Um, there are issues with that, though, and um, it will include things that certain members don't like. So how do you make sure that you have enough votes to get it um, on and off the House and Senate floors? Um, then there's this concept of what they call minibuses, which are uh, uh, chunks of government funding um, that are, are different than a, a short-term funding mechanism because they actually include policy within them. Um, that seems to be getting more discussion. Uh, then the third would be a continuing resolution or a short-term funding mechanism, which is what we're living in now. Now, one of the things that could happen is they could kick the can down the road on the first uh, and say, we have a plan to work through these, these mini buses of government funding, and we need six weeks to do it. It'd be really nice if we got through filing season with a short-term um, funding mechanism, and then they could figure out how to resolve the whole uh, funding issue. Uh, be really good for preparers. So we'll see. There's also a possibility of a shutdown. And I have to say that because uh, we've had several short-term funding measures that have kicked the can down the road, but they have been at high political cost. Uh, we saw Speaker McCarthy, you know, lose his job. We have a new Speaker mm. Johnson. Uh, the, the margins of the vote are, have been, you know, the minority uh, voting in or along with a handful of the majority, which is very unusual in the House of Representatives. So we have to continue to say that there's a possibility of a shutdown. I, I polled my team, Eric, mm -hmm. to say, what does everybody think? And for the most part, everybody thinks that there is going to be some some short term solution mm -hmm. uh, while they try and iron this out, which I think is a obviously a good sign uh, for for this tax season. But we have to prepare for a shutdown regardless. Okay, well, I'm sure it will be it'll be somewhat dramatic, right? Right to the end. <laughs> Always. So Mark, here's another beneficial ownership information. Uh, We've, we've had a number of BOI questions come in and there's just been some recent hearings and there's a big letter that the AICPA just sent out. Yeah, so so Eric, on Wednesday there was a hearing um, and FinCEN came in. FinCEN is the is Treasury's, um, you know, basically financial crimes uh, enforcement network. So they focus on money laundering. And the purpose of the hearing was oversight in the money laundering in general. Uh, however, BOI got a lot of focus because there's a lot of energy around it. Uh, a lot of the question, the tone of the questions was not, we're going to suspend this or we're going to, um, you know, repeal it. It was more, we want FinCEN to get this right. Uh, some, some challenges to concern around creep. Uh, you know, you've asked, FinCEN originally had a proposal for this much information. That amount of information has grown. Uh, FinCEN is asking for uh, more money. There's challenges around that. 
Uh, yeah. Definitely a big discussion about the confusion in the small business market. And so, you know, how is FinCEN going to address that? And the director basically said that she was looking for ideas to help address it. So it, it didn't give us a lot of confidence. Uh, we um, have, again, basically focused on awareness. Uh, you know, we, we have also been in favor of suspension until they can get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, we, sent, we sent a letter to the committee, to the leaders on, on both, in both the House and the Senate that um, coincided with this hearing, basically to say, just, just suspend, hit pause until you can get this right. Make sure that everybody understands their responsibilities and make sure that, that the third parties, the preparers like us, have, have our questions answered and are comfortable in providing these services. So uh, good questions were asked. I don't think we, again, we think the best thing would be to suspend it. But right now we have to prepare to you know, work with clients if we're gonna do that work in order to implement it because they are moving forward. Well, that's a good segue, Mark. Uh, for the resources that we continue to develop. So, uh, Melanie, uh, engagement letters. We last week we we covered that you know CNA is is providing coverage. Um, if you want to kind of run through these, and you and I are, and, and Mark are going to have to keep on pace because we we do have a lot a lot of materials still to cover. We do, and I am just so thrilled to announce that we have an engagement letter that is now available. We attached it as a downloadable to this. There's the link, and of course, all these resources that you see on this page can be found on the AICPA's BOI resource page, and it is available to all AICPA members. We also put together some new FAQs um, all around reporting services and practices concerns. And we definitely answer the question, can a CPA provide BOI reporting services? We also ask what tools do practitioners have um, as they take on BOI services? So I definitely encourage you to please reference it, take a look at it, read through it carefully, because there's a lot of good information there. Um, also, February 21st, we are offering a free webinar in which various tax practitioners are talking about how they plan to approach in the offerings for BOI services. So again, all this information can be found in all of those links, but the AICPA BOI resource landing page gets updated constantly. Okay, ERC, again, it's a hot topic. Um, the AICPA Member Insurance Program released Q&As regarding the ERC voluntary disclosure, and they are asking, the intention is to help CPAs with the questions they may have. So it answers questions such as like, what to tell clients, what to do if a client requests for this type of assistance, and it also includes an engagement letter. Now, the IRS also released the seven warnings ERC claims could be incorrect this week, and there really isn't that much information that's new within it, but it really is meant to raise more awareness around the March 22nd deadline for the Voluntary Disclosure Program. And the IRS simply believes that by raising awareness with taxpayers, this can kind of help guide them in the right directions. We can go ahead and skip to the IRS reminders. There's lots of reminders that are coming out. Cryptocurrency. Um, just please be aware that you need to continue reporting your cryptocurrency and digital assets income. And this year, it is not just Form 1040, but it's also the 1041, 1065, 1120, 1120S. And we have a great podcast that covers any misconceptions around cryptocurrency. Automated collections notices, just a reminder that they did start. They were releasing them or notices to about 5 million um, people who prepared returns in 2020 and 2021. And there is penalty relief associated with that. So please look through all um, those links to be able to get details. And then I have to touch base on the crypto um, or cybersecurity eFIN, which is electronic filing identification number scams. Unfortunately, I have had members reach out to me that fell victim to this. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're whip smart and they even did the right things of checking the phishing emails. And there was a difference between a period and a comma and it did them in and they became victims. And finally, the Form 1099-K, there are new updates. Um, please take a look at them. 50 questions were updated. And moving on to disaster relief, just making sure people are aware, um, Maine and West Virginia did get relief for storms and flooding, mudslides, depending on what state they are in. And they were both extended to June 17th. 
Well, Melanie, what we'll do in open forum is we'll hit uh, some of those uh, questions related to you know strategies about filing or doing an extension. And th there's also some, some BOI questions we can address. But okay. thanks, Mark and Melanie, for this section. And now we're going to uh, bring up uh, Kimberly Ellis Taylor, uh, a good friend and a leader that we all know. Um, look at you know what you have done for the profession, leading the Maryland Association of CPAs, chair of the AICPA, um, chair of the AICPA National Commission on Diversity and Inclusion, um, a, a board member, very active board member, but, but even before you did all of these things, you built your small firm up, um, consulting firm up, and, and then you moved on to become a, a, an executive at Oracle. Uh, just to let everybody know, right now, you're sitting on a number of public boards, including U.S. Bank, Mutual of Omaha, and just recently announced uh, Marathon Petroleum. So, um, Kimberly, thanks for all that you do. And just to, just to kick things off, um, you know, you've got a very broad lens right now. You know these firms, you know the profession so well. You know, what insights, you know, on this today's world would you like to, you know, share with them before we get into some some topics related to strategy. But first off, it's just it's fantastic to have you here with us today. Absolutely, Eric. I am so delighted to be here, especially when it's the one millionth uh, <laughs> showing. So that's always a great thing. And I know that the IRS on the front end of our discussion captivated the audience. But here's here's what I think. We are in a world that is changing even more quickly than some of us even envisioned. Some of our colleagues may have thought that they were going to be retired by now, but no, you're still here. We still need you. And I will tell you from just being a board director, we rely on trusted advisors. We rely on you to give us the insight that we need in an environment of mergers and acquisitions, in an environment of heightened regulatory scrutiny, in an environment of uncertainty in the marketplace. And so I want all of our colleagues, whether they're in small firms or large firms or they're in business and industry, know that this is our time because when there is complexity, that's when you need trust and that's when you need business advisors. And I think of us as the business firefighters. So we're running in to help companies and businesses across the world. And so I'm just delighted to share those uh, initial responses. Well, thank you. And you've, I mean, you really are a strategist, Kimberly. And, and this, is, this is your slide about, you know, how to think about strategy and growth planning. So let's just you know, double click on a, on a couple of items here. And you, you, you know, we've got members of business and industry with us today. We've got a lot of tax practitioners. We've got, you know, members of other areas of the pra other areas of the practice. One thing when I look at this list that, that really strikes me that everyone should be thinking about is, you know, your target market, who, you know, who are you serving? What's your niche and differentiation in, in service offerings? Well, that's absolutely true. This is like my world famous pound cake recipe for mm -hmm. strategy and growth. And, and I know that we're busy. I get that 100 percent. We're working 10 hours a day, 12 mm -hmm. hours a day. Mm -hmm. But Benjamin Franklin, Franklin said it best. If you fail to plan and plan to fail. So we know that we need to take the time to think about what's happening next. We mm -hmm. have to diversify our business and our workload so that we're not only working four or five months of the year, but we're working across the year. And I had someone tell me when I was at Oracle, they gave me great advice. And they said, Kimberly, if you have five to seven client meetings a week, you will make your number. You will do the things that are down for you for this particular uh, business line that I was leading. And he was right. Now, when you're this busy every day, you're in the thick of things, you're on the front line, you're doing the work, you're not thinking about what your clients are seeing. They're seeing this evolving environment. They see the cyber issues. They are worried about the government shutdown. We need our trusted advisors, at least the leader or someone who's designated to lift their head up and talk about some of these very things that we're showing here. So even if you're busy, this is the perfect time to one, either think about your plan all over again. So if you haven't done it over since the pandemic, 
now is the time because some of the things that we went through and did in the pandemic changed how we operate today. So you can't just take your 2018 plan, dust it off and say, this is going to be great because we got to keep going. But let's say you're on a every year to 15 months. I think that's the shelf life. We don't get all this time we used to have or we thought we did. Now is the time to look at target markets. And, and that was the question that you asked. Because the target markets that you may have said, well, do we have the credibility? Do we have the permission to win? Will people accept us in this market? I think if you've been doing amazing work and your clients and customers, they may not know that you have the capacity to do these other things, but we have to be intentional about those target markets and learning the people, the processes, the technology, the financial uh, environments. Because when it's your time, you have to be ready. And if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So looking at your planning from a target market perspective, do you want to work in nonprofits in the Washington, D.C. area? Do you want to work in manufacturing or only do private companies like Mutual of Omaha or public companies like Marathon Petroleum or U.S. Bank? Be specific about where you think you have the permission to win and then start developing all of the other ingredients you need. But I think when you target and focus, you'll inspire your team. People will be attracted to your vision of success for the future. Mm. It can't be like we're winging it. We can't mm. just luck up and do a roll. We really have to identify what's really important for us and the business that we're trying to grow. Well, thanks, Kimberly. I mean, a lot, a lot of insights there. The, the final bold here, monitor, adjust, and evolve. What's your cadence on that? Well, here's the thing. I, I think we should have an environment of continuous strategic mm. planning. Mm -hmm. We can't do get 50 people in a room or five people in a room, take a whole week. We have to be continuously looking at the landscape. What's the business environment? What's happening with interest rates? What's happening with Gen AI? What's happening with sustainability? What's happening with cannabis? We know it's a matter of time before it's going to be something that's approved and not a Schedule One felony at the, the national level. Are you thinking about what your clients are thinking about and getting there first? The clients are running. They want you to run faster than them so you can be the trusted advisor. So going here to the next slide, Kimberly, continuous transformation is not an option. So <laughs> expand not. on this a little bit. I mean, it's a very dynamic time. Um, how, how, how do you know? break out a little bit more in some of these boxes for us? Well, it's because it would be so easy, I think, if we could just do one particular area, you do that all day, nothing ever changes, but that's not the real world. And that's, that's not why people would pay us a premium because what I'm talking about is differentiated solutions that lead to competitive advantage. If we are getting in conversations about cost, then that means the differentiation that we think we have or how we go to market, the superior world-class customer environment and experience that we offer, people aren't willing to pay for it. That means that they don't see the value that we are putting out. So that means we have to work harder. And that means continuously evolve, continuously thinking about how do we offer better service? How do we define our products? How do we have high quality solutions so that we can pay more, get paid more, I should say, and so that people will know that this is an area that they don't have to look anywhere else. We offer a number of things, not just the one or two they might be using us for. So I, I would just say that to say, Eric, continuous transformation is the energy it's the excitement for change. It's the excitement for business growth. It's getting the team galvanized. It's getting the clients understanding that if you can't do it, you know someone who does. You're the quarterback in their environment. They trust you. They believe in you. And they're willing to give you a shot if you're going into new areas because you've done so well for them. Kimberly, so final thoughts here before we kind of go into open forum with you. It's in it's in tax season right now. Trusted advisor, a lot of you you heard about all you know the pressures here in D.C. Um, related to uncertainty. Um, I'm just giving. Yeah, I know you're not a tax professional. Uh, I heard it all. Can, though. Can talk, what's your 
how, how do you how, how do you, how would how would you advise them to deal with this? I mean, one of the the top question here they want to, which I think is a great idea. One person came in and said, "Will you please do a poll on who's going to file now versus wait and see what happens with the legislation uh, versus doing an extension?" So here's here's what I think as it relates to our tax practitioners, and I know you're busy, but yeah. I think if you carved out a little bit of time each week and decided what areas you want to work on for the rest of the year, how you're going to grow, how you're going to scale, how you're going to offer even bit better service, how you're going to continue those relationships, your clients aren't going to wait four months for you to come back and say hi. You got to be saying hi the whole time. You've got to be talking to them the whole time because when you finish this busy part of your season, there's more work to do. There's more growth activity. And I think your business can scale 20% year over year, double digit growth if you plan it appropriately and strategically. Okay. Well, this was great, Kimberly. Your energy, your vision. Again, thank you for what you're doing for the profession. Um, just a tremendous role model for all of us. We've got a, a longer segment with Kimberly in this Digital CPA podcast. Uh, so I encourage you to you know, hear more of her thinking around you know, connecting technology and accounting and strategy. So let's bring uh, Mark and Melanie back up. Uh, so Melanie, I think that was a great idea. We, we, we do do polls and maybe we should do a poll to the town hall audience on what on what they are doing. I know before, uh, you know, in our prep for today's session, we talked about doing a panel with some tax practitioners just to kind of, because everyone's gonna have slightly different strategies, but a lot of questions coming in saying, okay, so great, the IRS commissioner said file now. I don't necessarily agree. Um, I wanna, I I should do an extension or I'm, I'm gonna wait. I mean, this is gonna, you know, cost my client uh, more money. Uh, take me more time, take take more time on my side. So maybe just kind of expand a little bit more on some of your, your opening comments because we did not talk about, you know, the extension strategy. So that's part of the reason why I love tax. I know not everybody loves tax and it can be very hard, but from the tax world, you know, it's not a one size fits all for everybody. And that's why you get all the different questions and the different approaches for it. I think what the main point of what I was saying about should we file now, it's don't count on the legislation right now. Mm -hmm. Because if that's what you're waiting on and that's the sole piece you're waiting on, go ahead and file now. Um, as far as an extension, absolutely, that's a strategy. And that's a strategy that some people have in place, even when legislation isn't in place. And it's something that they do. There's lots of considerations for businesses, depending how they bill, that come into play. And of course, there's just different approaches where, you know, there are some clients, they want what they want when they want it. And if you have to amend in the future, you have to amend in the future. So it really is something to take a look at. Um, again, um, I'm going to plug the tax section. Uh, they have great resources and podcasts that are available to everybody on how to manage the practice during these periods. Well, you, you one thing you just highlighted at the end, there was a, a few questions that came in was said, it, well, it's the client's decision as well. It's not my... It, right. you know, it is it is the client's decision. So, yeah. all right, Mark, uh, ERC and, and Melanie, you can, you know, should um, should they file a, a, an ERC claim right now? Uh, should they initiate an ERC claim? What are we saying, Melanie? We're saying yes, right? I think so. The thing yeah. about the legislation and the retroactivity, you have to understand that ERC is a pay for. So. Right. It can change, yes. Can Congress look at it and make it the effective date of when the bill were to pass, assuming it's going to pass, right? Can they change the date? They can, but it's a pay for. So I think if you want to be on the more conservative, extra cautious side, go ahead, move forward and file. Um, totally agree. There are concerns with the billings associated. Talk with the client. Let them understand the risks associated with them and ultimately let them make that decision. Just to add to that, um, I mean, if ERC isn't in the bill, the bill doesn't happen because that's what's funding it. Um, and secondly, because of the focus on the percentages of fraud and the numbers that they're seeing on the fraud side, they're coming back at ERC. So even if it's not in this bill, they're going to be focusing on it. 
So, yeah, a lot, and this is, we're going to, again, as I say, we'll look at, I mean, Melanie, a lot of helpful questions that I, you know, superseded returns. I mean, the comment, comments on that. Um, so I think th this is something that in, in our next town hall, we're, we're looking at a, a practitioner's uh, tax segment. And also just on BOI, uh, we, we've got that special webinar coming up, but we're nice. also going to be giving you some, some practical tips uh, related to um, and get you know practitioners advice on BOI and there's more and more solutions coming out. There's some questions that came in about how to do the filing. It's like like everything, technology is going to be playing 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 a role. Um, Kimberly, um, anything else that you would you would like to add? A uh, lot of lot of positive comments coming in um, from from the town hall community on your your highlights. Oh, it's, it's, it's always great to be here. And I know that this is the time where some people are like, Kimberly, I can't think I'll come back to you. But I would just encourage us to think about our clients, the business objectives we have for the year, our plans to grow, our plans to go into new markets, our plans to differentiate. That needs to start now. We can't wait because by the time you get to it in May, by the time you get to it in June, there will always be something from a tax perspective. Now, my understanding of tax is that the season goes on and on and on and on. So it's not defined anymore. So I can't say wait until the tax season is over because you won't get to it. And if you're in business and industry, you know that those management reports and decisions that need to be made are all gonna be calibrated around your planning, your budgeting, your performance evaluations and analysis. So we gotta get started. Small, small parts that will then thanks. lead to bigger parts. Well, thanks, Kimberly. I think that's some some good closing advice. And Mark, I mean, just a lot of lot of comments coming back in. Even, you know, the government shut down and you know, how does that go into the whole the, the whole tax bill? So maybe one final comment <laughs> in, no. with that. Is that you know that obviously it's it's, it's uncertain. You know. A lot of uncertainty. It absolutely plays in, uh, but the front and center they're going to have to deal with government funding when they all get back from the recesses. Um, I mean, listen, there are other issues. They just you know there was an impeachment vote in the House that now the Senate has to deal with. They'll have to find floor time for that, uh, and so all of these things impact the tax bill. It's all interconnected because they've got to figure out time to resolve these issues. Uh, we're watching it closely. Uh, again, we think the vote right now amongst our team is that they'll come up with a short-term solution. It'd be great to get it past, you know, the middle of April, um, but we're not sure. And we've got to prepare for a shutdown. Okay, well, thank you. As Kimberly, I liked how you said this is exciting being on the million-plus edition of the Town Hall. <laughs> no, million-plus viewers on the Town Hall. We have not been doing this a million times yet, uh, but thank you uh, to the audience Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Melanie. I'll hit these final slides here. Uh, so here, town hall resources. Uh, a lot of people always are asking, how can I make sure I'm getting the auto registration and calendaring? Um, it, this is how you do it. You can go to our, our town hall resource at cpa.com. Here's a visual of how to make sure you're adding uh, these town halls to your calendar. Uh, you can also leverage the on-demand versions. We've got this uh, Advisors Edge newsletter, uh, which you can take advantage of. Gives a lot of insights uh, related to the CAS practice moving into the advisory services area. And here's who we have set up for our February 29th town hall. Uh, we're gonna have Dan Hood from Accounting Today uh, with us. He's gonna be giving you some sneak previews uh, to one of their uh, most interested, most interesting editions, which is uh, the Top 100 report. Uh, Lisa Simpson will, will be with us, Sue Coffey, uh, the CEO of Public Accounting, as well as Betsy Kreischer and Mark Peterson will be back with us again uh, to provide uh, the DC and advocacy update. So here's the dates of our two next town halls, February 29th and March 21st. It was great being with you today. I uh, hope you have a good uh, end of February, and we will see you on, uh, on, on Leap Year Day, February 29th. Look forward to being with you then. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall Series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts 
Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.